All right. Let me get set up here. All right. What's up, everybody? This is Wall Street Jesus here for anybody who's new. Uh, again, I apologize for those go-to webinar issues, but uh, looks like we're cooking with gas here now. Uh, knock on wood. All right. And um, if you haven't taken a look at futures, because uh, that's usually when we start these webinars, right when futures open up, S&P futures, uh, we have limit down again. All right. And you know, the news over the weekend, I mean, wait, wait till you guys see, and I'm not trying to spook anybody, but wait till you see what New York looks like with this virus over the next couple of weeks. It's, it's going to be movie-like. That's how scary it might get. So, you know, this is something we, we kind of expected, right? Uh, not, that, not to say we expected, you know, further downside in the market, because we don't know how much of it the market has factored in already or anything like that. Uh, what I do? Did I do that wrong here? Oh, no. um, but this is kind of something we anticipated, right? We wanted to make sure uh, that we are aware that the news out there is going to, um, to get worse, right? It's not going to get better. And the reason that's important is because a lot a lot of times when these markets do bottom, okay, it comes at peak negative news, okay, right? That whole capitulation, everything about it comes when even when you're trying to hold out and remain open-minded or bullish, even you can't see a potential bottom inside, all right? And, and that's the importance of you know, being aware and keeping that open mind and understanding what the future may hold as far as reminding yourself that the news is going to get worse so you don't get wrapped up into that noise. That doesn't mean that we have to step out and start buying things with two hands um, just because, you know, we, we feel there may be a bottom at some point here, right? We don't, have to, we don't have to stick out our necks and try to be a hero, but a lot of these bottoms come when you least expect it, right? When they're, like I just mentioned, when you, it's difficult for you to see it, no matter how, how much you try, it's almost impossible to see, all right? And what's going on now, all right, in this market, and this is one of the craziest things, because not to, you know, sound like an old man again, but I've been through quite a few bear markets and corrections, right? And the worst by far that I've been through was 2008. Okay, and even if you didn't trade through it, you guys probably uh, heard a lot about it, all right? This is different, right? A lot of people ask me, is this worse than 2008? I don't think you could even compare the two, okay? And I'm not really ready to label this as bad as 2008 until we start, all of us in here, start going to our bank accounts and liquidating them, right? You guys have heard me say that. That's, that was 2008. You were worried about the whole financial system collapsing around you. You were worrying about the bank that you had money in not being open when you get up for breakfast the next morning. That was 2008, okay? What's going on now is, is something completely different. I've never been through it. None of us have been through it, okay? And it's, you know, it's a health issue. And the scary thing about what's going on right now is that unlike 2008, when you knew that it was going to be a drawn out period of time, that things were going to be rough, right? Not a lot of risk taking, all right? This situation, nobody has any idea, not even the smartest minds in the medical field, right? They had no idea how long this is going to last and what kind of impact it may have, right? And just think of it logically. We are going into a global, where we're already started, right? Globally, an economic freeze-up, okay? Where every economy around the world is just locking up and sort of going into a depression even worse than a depression, over the short term. Now think about that for a second, okay? 
All right, but a lot of people compare like 2008. 2008, at least, you know, the economy was bad. But once they bailed out the financial system, once they found some footing, you knew things were going to be rough. But there wasn't going to be a lockup, a freeze up. In other words, right now, you know, hotels, transportation, you know, restaurants, there's nobody going, they're not, they're not taking in any revenue right now. Okay. And if this thing lingers, and this is the threat, okay, if this thing lingers longer than a month or so, then you got where shit's going to hit the fan, okay? Because there's, there's no saving a lot of these industries, sectors, groups, if things are going to freeze up, right? If, if, if people are in lockdown, all right, and you're going to have some stragglers who go out and do their thing, but if the majority of people and businesses are in lockdown and this thing lingers, I don't think it can linger. I think they got to weigh, you know, the risk of fatality to just to collapse economically. And this is globally, this is around the world. All right. And I'm not trying to scare anybody, right? For those of you who may not know me, I'm labeled the perma bull. Okay. So this is coming from a perma bull, but that's, that's the worst case scenario and the risk out there. Okay. And that's why this market, right, right from the get go. Okay. This market knew that there was going to be this lockdown and freeze up over the short term. And what the market's trying to do is factor that all in, in one shot. All right. In one shot. Now the good news, right. I probably scared the shit out of you, but the good news. Okay. Is we don't know if that worst case scenario, you know, we don't know the probability of it. We don't know the likelihood of it. Nobody knows. Right. Nobody knows what, you know, what course this virus is going to take, you know, when vaccinations or even, you know, aside from the vaccine itself with some remedies and stuff like that come out. All right. So the worst case scenario, in my opinion, is not going to be put on the table immediately. Right now, the market's trying to factor in the next two months. Okay. And it's likely going to overshoot and then find the bottom and base around there, there'll be some sharp rallies, choppiness, volatility is probably going nowhere, right? Volatility is going to be around, all right? And then, you know, see how things play out. And, and the market's ultimately going to tell us what the future looks like ahead of time, okay? But the market's been factoring in that global economic lockdown freeze up. And that's why literally without a, I don't even remember a rally in this, in this poll. It seems like every day we're limited down. Um, this market is going from A to Z because it knows that over the short term, the market knows the future, right? The market knows what's going to go on. There's going to be unemployment numbers like we've never seen before, okay? Businesses, major sectors of the economy, service sectors of the economy are going to be down 90% plus, okay? So that's why... On top of that now, and you got the Fed and fiscally, right? They're throwing in the kitchen sink. They're talking about a $4 trillion package now, right? That's likely not enough. You're going to see the Fed get as clever as you ever seen or thought they were capable of, okay? And eventually, that's going to put a Band-Aid on things, okay? So I'm making that point because that's what I'm looking for, Right? I'm not, I'm not going to try to pretend that I know more than Dr. Fauci or any of that crew and try to predict what course this virus may take, all right? I'm wasting my time. It's a complete guess, all right? But what I'm looking for, because already the damage that's been done, already this market has been factoring in, you know, a lot of negativity, I'm looking to see where the smart money will step in and start to look at certain situations and see value there, okay? And I'll give you an example. We talk about like travel, restaurants, and all that stuff out there, okay? Those are, the, you know, the groups that are going to get hit the hardest. But there are other facets of the economy, right? A lot of tech and stuff like that that are going to survive and thrive, 
okay? So the market eventually, when we get out of this panic liquidation phase, even if, it, even if it's temporary, the market's gonna start looking and trying to find some value and opportunities out there, okay? And that's a good segue into what I wanna go over because uh, those of you who uh, are new or are members of the Steam Room, this is kind of the stuff I look at religiously, right? And a lot of members, you know, pay close attention to, okay? They work extremely well, right? In non-panic environments, okay? They work well in normal corrections. In liquidation phases and panics like we're in right now and in markets where you got a backdrop where it's not I like, it's 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 like we said, a medical, a health situation, you're going to have overshoots. Okay, that's normal. All right, but this is what we look at on a day-to-day -day basis. Why? To try to get an idea of how much selling may be left. Okay, and then once we get a grasp on that, there's one final confirmation, one final trigger that will get us involved and start to look for opportunities a lot more aggressively than we have been, okay? Because a lot of us have been really conservative, day trading, that sort of thing, you know, not to toot our own horns, but a lot of us have been in a nice cash position for a good amount of this pull. All right, for a lot of these reasons, because a lot of these things were signaling extreme bullishness as opposed to what we're looking at now, okay? Uh, but let's start off, we'll just dive into this and then I could take some questions uh, and we could talk about the, the market some more. Where's my coffee? Oh, all right, so right here, let me start showing off my pen a little too, okay? Might as well, right here, okay? Oh, that's not what I wanted. But anyway, that's, this is short-term tactical signals, okay? So these signals here, they're based off sentiment a lot in regards to the option market of how players are lining up calls and puts, all right? And what they tell us are how traders are positioning, all right? And when they get to an extreme, and they do that a lot in a liquidation phase like we are in now, all right? We look for signs out of the flow and sweeper activity for short-term intraday squeezes. And, you know, in this type of market, those squeezes can be powerful, all right? So this tells us that they're lined up on, you know, or leaning too heavily offside on either side, and we're looking for the flow to confirm a change in trend, all right? And this is what we have going into tomorrow's session. We got a squeezometer, all right? That's the only intraday indicator on here, okay? Look at it as 40% bulls on a scale of zero to 100%, all right? When we see, in this environment, when we see around that 30% number or less, that's where we wanna start looking for signs out of the flow um, for a squeeze over the short term, all right? So we're not there yet, but we're getting close, all right? Uh, this is an end-of-day sentiment indicator, all right? Similar to the squeezometer, but just calculates end-of-day sentiment. Um, this is already in squeeze mode, all right? So I, to put it this way, if we were in a normal climate, okay, and we have this with a bullish signal, we're looking to get involved off any signs of sweeper activity we see going into tomorrow right? Now, in this climate, you want to stay a little patient because there's larger forces at play, obviously, right? Um, but this, we have a bullish signal going into tomorrow, so we want to start looking for signs out of the flow. Um, put to call ratios are elevated, right? A lot of you are familiar with put to calls, all right? But they're off their panic levels, all right? We, we were at panic. We were seeing panic readings, I think it was early last week, and believe it or not, we had that pretty sizable squeeze intro, I think it lasted one day, right? What was it, one day? And then the put the calls came in a little bit, right? So we're still elevated, but we're not at the put the call, panic, buy puts, the end of the world's coming 
type thing that you like to see in this environment. All right. Uh, this is another short term indicator we like to look at in this climate. Um, and that's a measure of those inverse ETFs. Right. So think about those three times bearish ETFs that get a lot of play in this type of market. All right. When we see a spike in that reading, um, that's where a lot, of, a lot of times the market has a tendency to squeeze quite sizably. And, you know, that's another short-term indicator we like to follow, especially in this environment. In a bullish trending environment, you, get, you don't get a signal off that. So it's kind of useless. All right. But in this climate, uh, we like to pay attention to it. All right. This is more now of probably the stuff you guys would be more interested in. All right, this is, how do I scroll? Hold on. Oh, I know why, hold on. Okay, this here, intermediate term sentiment, is more of the positioning, a measure of positioning out there, right? So this, I mentioned tacticals, how traders, like how a lot of us are playing over the short term. Okay, intermediate term is a measure on more uh, positioning where they're not as quick. Okay, if we're seeing extreme bearish signs, that usually is going to last for a while. Okay, I'll give you an example. A lot of these things into the highs, right, when the market was making new highs before this virus took over, were all flashing extreme bullish, which is bearish, our interpretation, right? So what that tells us is on the positioning side of things, everybody is already all in, okay? Now, that doesn't mean the market's gonna top out at right when those signals go off, all right? But what that signals to us, and that's why a lot of us were playing with gloves on and got into a cash position primarily as far as swing positions, et cetera, what that tells us is, if something comes around, and it happened to be a virus, it could have been anything, okay? If a trigger happens to show up and creates some legitimate selling in the market, there's a lot of supply out there, right? Everyone's been bullish. Everyone's pretty much already in the market. There's not a lot of cash on the sidelines, right? And when it comes time to sell, there's going to be a lot of selling, okay? That's why these signals are important, okay? Not because, again, I, I like to beat the, the point home because a lot of novice players, a lot of new traders in this game, they look at sentiment, a lot of this stuff, and they want to see exacts. They want to see a bullish signal, nail the low to the tick. They want to see a, you know, a caution signal, they want to be able to sell out of the market at a tippy tippy top and there's no further upside from where they got out. All right. But that's fantasy land. Okay. So what we're seeing now, okay. And you can see a couple of signals here in yellow that aren't there yet, but in my opinion, the bulk of the sentiment stuff I look at to measure intermediate term positioning is there. Okay. Whatever is not there is close enough and the way it looks is going to be there by the time this thing bottoms, all right? So that's why, and those of you who are members um, and have been paying attention know, you know, at no point throughout this whole pull, or even as the market was making highs, I had any interest of buying anything that I'm going to apply a any time to. Right? If I'm going to buy calls for a swing position, I'm not going to go out three to six months when everything's at extreme bullishness and I know a high probability of a pull's coming. Right? So throughout, there was a little period of the market, you know, making new highs and then us selling off. The sentiment indicators were telling us to avoid doing that, play off the tactical signals for now. Okay? Now these things are there, okay? And that's why starting last week when they first started lighting up for the first time throughout this whole poll, now I am interested in paying attention to any signs at a flow 
that there's real buying coming into names with time behind it. You know what I mean? All right, so now if I see, example, McDonald's, right? They come in and they fire absolute missiles and jank calls, okay? Not only do I want to trade that tactically based off the aggressiveness and the size behind it, I may want to consider start piecing in to a position in some jan calls into weakness. Make sense? All right, so that's what the intermediate term sentiment does for us. All right, so let's go one by one here so you guys know. I mean, these are some of the key ones that we pay attention to, right? Uh, this is the one out of uh, BOVA, Bank of America. If you guys see me post it a lot, a lot of you guys know it already. The bull bear indicator, okay? Has a fantastic track record, has pretty much nailed every low outside of a credit crisis. Has come early, you know, in 2008, flashed some early signs, stuff like that. Here, we'll probably flash, right? Just got bullish now. Likely, it may, it may be early. I mean, it doesn't look like this selling's letting up right now, all right? But that's irrelevant, all right? That's telling us that the positioning based off this indicator, and that's what makes it up, right? A measure of positioning, is telling us that a lot of money has already liquidated, okay? A lot of the selling has already been done. Uh, DSI, that's the Daily Sentiment Index. Some people, some of you like it, some of you don't. Okay, I don't trade exclusively off that. It just makes up the whole intermediate term signal. Okay, last, I think we closed Friday at like 9 or 10% bulls. So similar to the squeezometer, that me measures a percentage of bulls on a scale of 0 to 100. When you get over 90, you got to be careful. Make sure you raise some cash, raise your stops. Don't put on any additional risk, okay? When you get under 10, you want to start looking for opportunities. So the same thesis, as you can see here, okay? Uh, re weekly retail put-to-call indicator, okay? This is a very precise put-to-call indicator. It measures smaller trades, okay? Non-sweeps, smaller trades, bought to open only, Okay, so put the call usually just measures volume. This measures bought to open puts only and calls, all right, and is updated weekly. This flashed a bullish signal for the first time last week, okay. Into the highs, it flashed a bearish sign, and that came, I think, two weeks before we topped out and rolled over. So, again, not nailing the top to an exact. But if you paid attention, definitely saved you a lot of pain on the downside, all right? So that's there. Um, another one, smart money indicator. I don't have to get into the details of it. Usually is an indicator measured of buying weakness. That got into bullish territory. Here's one that did it. And this is fascinating because it irritates me. The AAII, which you guys, all of you know it, okay? A lot of people look at it and they just, they pay no attention to it. But it's got an impeccable track record, all right, of flashing bullish signals around bottoms. All right, and there's a couple of different ways to look at it. Some look at it as the percentage bulls. Some like to look at percentage bears in, um, a, you know, a correction or a bear market. Uh, there's also another way to look at it, which... I like to start off with, and that's a bull bear ratio, okay? And that hasn't signaled bullish yet. We thought we were going to get it last week. We did not. If we don't get it this week, I give up, okay? But that should be there this week off the price action last week, all right? So this has been holding out here. Um, AIM, this is professional money. Advisors, investor model, more professional positioning. Uh, this in the type of market we were in prior to this, you don't even look at this indicator because you're not going to get any signals from it. Okay, only at tops and bottoms is where this thing flashes. Okay, and this thing is in bullish area and even more so 
close to a zero reading, which is really, really rare. Okay. Same with the NAA, NA, I think there's two A's. I screwed that up, but I am. Okay. A lot of you guys probably heard of that as well. That's another one. Professional money, fidelity funds, professional money. They all got into bullish fear, greed. You guys know that has been in bullish for a while. That's actually quite normal. Uh, that comes really early. Here's an interesting one too, right? Uh, this is out of City, City Group. Uh, this is Tobias Lefkowitz, his indicator, okay? Panic euphoria. And this is another indicator. Rarely are you going to get panic or euphoria signals. You, those signals are rare, especially in the type of market we were in, because again, they just measure panic and euphoria, nothing in between. Okay, for those of you who've been following along, we got a euphoria signal into the highs, and we still haven't got a panic signal, but, but, shit, they did a lot of posting this weekend, you know, but, Here's where we're at. Okay? So you can see throughout the pit, I'll give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, we were still up here, if you can believe that. Okay? And now, all of a sudden, as this market continues to melt away here, um, here's where we closed at the end of last week. This is a weekly indicator. Okay? So, Likely after this week, this will be there as well. All right, so that's my point. Everything, even if it's not there, is really, really close, okay? Here's one, right, we've all been waiting for. Hedge funds, okay? They were all in into the rally. The Fed forced them into risk assets and equities. They were as long as they can be. They were actually buying dips up until recently. And now, I wouldn't say they're net short, but they're clean, as we like to say. Okay? So in other words, their exposure now on the long side is minimal. Okay? For now. For now. All right? This, again, up until this last reading, this last update, they were net long and stubborn for a lot of this drop, okay? So that's also, you know, a promising sign. Now, all this is fine and dandy, okay, if we're in normal, quote-unquote, market conditions, all right? And no, if you're wondering what normal market conditions are, they're where credit is not a factor. That's my definition of it, right? There's no systemic credit risk, right? Like what we're talking about now, forget about credit. You're talking about a global depression over the next month or two, okay? So obviously credit is extremely at risk, hence what the Fed is doing, right? If we were in normal market conditions, any, like the buying in McDonald's and some of the select buying we've been seeing I would own every single name and I'd be swinging them, okay? But when you get into these panic type markets and it happens every so often, right? I mean, 2008 was the last one that really was panicky and had some systemic risk to it. You have to, this is the ultimate signal for me, okay? This ultimately tells me that the money on the street that knows a hell of a lot more than you and I has access to a lot better information than you and I, okay? And if you're not man or woman enough to admit that in this game, you got a rough, rough period coming, okay? But when the money, the smart money out there is starting to notice 
and looking to take advantage of everything we just went over, all right, and I start to see signs of that in this, that's the ultimate confirmation to where I want to start being more aggressive, right? I want to start putting on long exposure, all right? And the way I measure the smart money getting in, okay, there are two ways that I know, and I've been in this game 20 plus years, right? You got the options market, which for me is the only information in real time that we can see in real time orders being filled and taking place, okay? From my experience, when you get a drawdown like we just had, okay, when you get a drawdown that looks like this and a washout in names and quality that looks like that, when these folks, right, when sweepers want to buy, they don't nibble their way in, okay? They come in with guns blazing, they come in with confidence. They come in showing that they've been sitting on cash and are excited to put money to work for whatever reason they may see, okay? So it's obvious, all right? And a perfect example of that, I'll give you an example. Those of you who saw the McDonald's action, right? You could just see the difference in that action compared to everything else we've been seeing everything else okay that when we see sweeper step in we're going to see that type of action maybe not that type of size but that type of aggressiveness in a multitude multitude of names okay big names leaders that have been hitting over the hit over the head and completely washed out so you'll see mcdonald's all of a sudden catch action like that then you have a name like Salesforce get tattooed, AMD get tattooed, Micron get tattooed. You understand? And it comes in bands and clusters. It, it doesn't come across as selective, right? What we've been seeing primarily on the buy side in the options market has been selective buying, okay? Selective, they're piecing in basically, right? And the, and the difficult part of selective buying in this type of market is that when you see one name catch action and it's only one name, it could mean anything. You know what I mean? Could mean anything. If Microsoft just catches, you know, one day of buying, all right, and you never see them again, maybe somebody is taking a huge short position in Microsoft and buying calls to protect their rear end. You understand? So the probability of it being a directional bet, especially in this climate, when it's selective buying, is a low, a lot lower probability. All right, kind of like how we treat the flow around earnings season and stuff like that. All right, we want to, you guys hear me talk about this all the time, especially those of you are members. We want to see waves of buying, right? You want to see them come in and annihilate shit, right? We've seen that before in bull markets, pullbacks, right? When they're excited, they tattoo stuff, all right? Coming out of the December 2018 correction, which was a legitimate correction, okay? They absolutely crushed everything on the call side. It wasn't even they found a group of names that they bought. They bought everything in its mother. The, the buying was so broad that you couldn't keep up with it. There were so many different names catching action. You know, you didn't know what to buy. But literally, you could have threw a, thrown a dart at any of them and made money, right? So that's ultimately, if you want to take a conser the most conservative approach in this mess, and I don't blame you, with the backdrop and everything else going on right now, that's ultimately the confirmation you want to see. Okay. You want to see missiles going off. You want to see excitement out of them. You want to see confidence out of them. All right. So that's sweeper activity. The other 
form of buying that I like to pay attention to in corrections, all right? We refer to them as Sharpies, okay, in the futures market, all right? Sharp hedges, okay? And what they like to do is when the public money is positioned for further downside off a pullback or a correction, okay? They like to take all their hedges off and be basically all in net long in the futures market, right? So total risk on. And then as a market rallies, okay, as the market rallies and continues higher, what do they do? They put hedges on, back on, little by little, until they get to a point, like, again, like if you guys, whoever was around to see it, into the highs here, they were totally hedged. Okay, so meaning they don't care, they couldn't care less how much more this market had further upside. Okay, they weren't interested in benefiting off that. They felt the risk to the downside was so dramatic that they were worried and concerned more about the downside than they were of any further potential upside. Okay, so early on, it might have been even a month or maybe more, I don't know the exact. They were hedged to the max into, into the highs, okay? And so what's been going on now, and that's what you guys care about, okay? They just started taking hedges off last week. All right, so for the first time, they've been max hedged this whole trip down. This whole trip. I bullshit you not. I'll show you a chart when I can to confirm it. You guys know, those of you who have seen it, okay? Just last week, okay, they took a good chunk of those hedges off, okay? So, of course, me, I get excited. I get all you guys who are members excited, thinking and hoping that this week they would take the remainder of their hedges off and get net long, right, and create a bullish signal. They did not. <clears throat> all right, so this last week update, they did not, they stood pat. All right, so now where they, where they stand, they still have hedges on, okay? Not as much as they had into the highs, but there's no signal there that they've took all the hedges off and looking to just catch upside uh, risk. You know what I mean? All right, so those are the, uh, hold on a second. There we go. Those are the two key confirmation signals I look for. All right. And it makes sense, right? Because sentiment, what does sentiment mean, especially in this type of environment, if the big money out there is not noticing or paying attention to the same, same thing we are, right? It's almost like think of it like, you know, a company's got good <clears throat> fundamentals, right? Their earnings, exceptional growth. They just reported a quarter, but the market's in correction mode. Nobody notices those earnings. Nobody cares about those earnings. That stock's not going up, right? But eventually people will notice it and see value there and start buying the stock. And that's when they'll start trading higher. So it's all, almost the same thesis right? We want the smart money to notice that a lot of the positioning out there is washed out and putting their, putting their money where their mouth is, so to speak, okay? Uh, the last one on here is the total opposite of sharp players or sharp hedges, okay? And that's basically spec positioning, all right? And throughout my career, most of the time, almost all the time, um, when you see Hold on. When you see the smart money, okay, buying with no hedges all in, they're usually, the spec money is short, all in. I, I don't have the patience to write it out. All right, but you know what I mean? Usually these two here are complete opposite sides of the scale. When spec money is all in bullish, 
then the short money is hedged, max hedged. Into the highs, an example, the short money, uh, the, the riffraff spec money was net long and the hedgers were maxed out, hedged. All right, so these two usually go hand in hand, these two. All right, and the last thing I wanted to bring up um, that goes unnoticed for a good period of time in this type of environment, but is usually a good sign, okay, is what I have here. Okay, and that's insiders. Now, they usually buy into weakness, all right, but when you get into these type of periods, all right, or even 2008, when you're in liquidation mode, it's not always a given that insiders are buying, okay? Because people are worried about liquidity. They want to hold on to their cash, all right? Insiders have been buying pretty aggressively. And if you want to hear something crazy, you know the two groups? Who could guess? Well, some of the, those of you who are members know the two groups. But what do you think are the two groups leading the insider buying right now? Anybody want to venture a guess? Ooh, that's a good guess, but not retail. Energy, big poll, is one. But there's one more, I think, that took the lead over energy. Financials. Who said that? DH Rub. Energy and financials. Can you believe it? All right, and I'll give an example. I swear to you, financials, I can't believe it. Um, in 2008, you know, financials were the scariest part of the whole market. Insiders, nobody wanted to touch financials. You know, I just told you we were pulling money out of the banks because we thought banks weren't going to be around the next morning. Okay, so you have a good amount of insider buying, as you can see on this graph, led by financials and energy. Energy has been absolutely walloped. I mean, walloped. Okay. And, you know, I don't care insiders or not. I can't buy energy. If you gave me money and laid out the cash for me, I can't buy energy just to go for the, through the grief again. I'm done with energy. All right. But it just, it to me, you know, it stands out that insiders are buying into this mess like this uh, because if they were really, really concerned, you know what I mean? They would be holding off on it. And I'll give you an example, all right? You guys probably saw me tweet this out. RCL, Royal Caribbean, okay? Over here, okay, this thing dropped. Okay, and into this drop here, uh, you would think maybe insiders were looking to pick up some cheap Royal Caribbean, no? Right, that's the logic. They like to buy weakness. The CEO was dumping stock like he saw Jesus Christ and he told him the world was coming to an end. The CEO was unloading shares into this drop. What's that tell you? <laughs> you know what I mean? So granted, I agree with you guys. Like insiders are insiders. I don't really trade off of it or invest off it like, a, you know, as a signal in itself. But it says, it says some stuff when insiders are buying into this mess as opposed to if they were dumping like they were doing the financials in 2008 or they were doing what they were doing in these cruise lines. You know, it would be the complete opposite and would just add to the fear of everything else. All right. So um, those are the signals. All right. I know, especially for those of you who aren't familiar with it, may seem like a lot. Uh, but basically, the key takeaway is pretty simple. Okay. We are going into tomorrow, going into tomorrow's weakness, right? Looking for flow to set up. An intraday squeeze, that's short term right now, intraday, okay? So we don't care about the quality of the flow. It doesn't have to be huge, okay? We just want to see signs of some buying coming in to light the match, 
based off our tactical short-term signals for an intraday squeeze, okay? Our intermediate positioning signals are basically telling us things are pretty washed out as far as positioning is concerned, okay? There is a lot less selling. The selling is gonna have to come from all out liquidation or shorting from this point, okay? That's what that tells us, all right? But even more importantly, okay, if we see sweepers start to get aggressive on the call side and start to show some confidence and excitement that's been missing throughout this whole entire downdraft, that's going to be a strong signal that at least we're at an intermediate term low, okay? Doesn't mean new highs, doesn't mean a whole new bull market rally, an intermediate low. What's an intermediate low? Good question. Nobody asked that. I just asked myself, but I'll give you an example, okay? Here's an intermediate low. No matter how awful the market is or the backdrop is, okay, usually when players get washed out to the point what we're seeing now, before even if the market has lower to go, before it heads lower, you see stuff like this. Okay? So this is an intermediate, this is what I mean by an intermediate low. Draw here. Okay? See this? Wash, bottom, rally, double bottom, sets up this, okay? And you're probably saying, well, whoa, this? What the hell's the big deal out of this? Let me tell you something. With the amount of damage and carnage there's been out there, okay? You see this rally here? You're going to see winners that you've never seen before, okay? Forget about the bull market we've been in you're going to see names that you were in catching call activity that you will be out of that day, if not the next day, with a really nice profit, not scalping, okay? You see short squeezes, you know, things that came down from 50 to 12 that squeeze back to the 20s. You know what I mean? They're big moves, big moves, quick moves. And that's what we like. Okay, and that's ultimately, that's what's going to be the difference, okay? What we're going to see when that finally shows up, and it will, it's just a matter of when, okay? What we're going to see out of the flow, okay, when there's weakness, right, when they're selling, we're going to see buying, aggressive buying come into that. In other words, they're not, we're not going to see one McDonald's big buyer into the lows and then a rally. And then all of a sudden here come all those put sweepers again. Okay. You're going to get coal buyers that are committed, that are building positions that are accumulating. All right. And sometimes it lasts a month. Sometimes it can last three months. Sometimes it can last a lot longer than that. All right. But like I said, the, the bottom line to keep in mind is, especially the early stages of that move, there are a lot of big winners that can really make your year, especially if you've been sitting in cash. Hold on, let me shut my door here. Hold on. All right, so you know what I mean? Especially if you've been sitting in um, a nice cash position there are going to be a lot of big winners, a lot of quick winners. Uh, those of you who like to play options should have a field day. All right. And that's why, <clears throat> that's why it's important to pay attention to the flow and the signals out there because, you know, it's going to be easy to be souped up bearish because the news, guys, the news is not getting better. Wait till you see what New York looks like over the next couple of weeks. All right, if you haven't seen what New York is looking like now, wait till you see what New York is going to look like over the next couple of weeks. It's a disaster. It's a disaster. 
All right. So we'll see, you know, ultimately we'll see. It's a matter of timing. We could have that, you know, lower before it comes, but we want to keep an open mind to it. Now let's talk bearish, by the way. All right. I want to talk a little bit for you bears because I know you guys enjoy this. And um, from my experience, like what goes on in, in these type of climates, right? You see these cruise liners? Okay. You see all these cruise lines? They smell blood. They know these things are done. How it, they go to short the living piss out of these things, okay, until they get bailed out. That's what they do continuously. They come back and hammer these things, right? How are these cruise lines going to survive without a bailout? How? It's impossible. You know what I mean? It's impossible. All right, so what they do is they come back to these leveraged names that are in the heart of the debacle right now, you know, and they just keep coming until they force the government to step in and do something about it. All right. And that's the thing to look for in these things. All right. You, if you're shorting, that's the Cape bomb you got to be careful about, right? The government's stepping in. All right. On the long side, it's, you got to close your eyes and buy these things. And honestly, it's not a given. It's not a given because they need help. They need help. You know what I mean? They need help. All these things. I mean, Las Vegas Sands, I told you the story in 2008, all right? Las Vegas Sands went, I think it was to two bucks. Two bucks. Okay. Not because nobody would ever gamble again, but because Las Vegas Sands, there was a credit issue. The casinos need credit to function. You know? So uh, until the government stepped in and bailed out the whole economy, right? They just kept coming after the thing and oh, it was so close to putting it under. And right now, these casinos are dealing with you know, another major issue here, major issue here. So the difference between now and 2008 is the Fed learned from 2008. 2008, they were taking baby steps at this point. You know what I mean? Baby steps. Now they're firing bazookas right off the bat. So that, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the big difference. That's the big difference. Oh, no, the, I'm done in the, these things I'm buried in. They're not going to be. I'm not adding to them. But, you know, names like this, they're dead. They're highly levered names. These things are dead. Remember the other one? I don't own the other one. I own these SGMS leaps that are useless. IGT. Look at this. They're dead. You know, these things are dead. Again, there may be short squeezes off, right, government headlines of, bailouts and shit like that but how many bailouts can they how many bailouts can there be like that's the one thing i can't see this thing's not gonna this whole virus thing is not coming to an end of the month you know what i mean this thing's gonna be around i don't see how these things can survive without getting bailed out yeah, Boeing is getting bailed out, right? We know that already. Like, Boeing's got to be the first to get bailed out. Otherwise, they're dead. You know? Uh, take two, like a name like Take Two, I think when we do find that intermediate term bottom, I think these are the names that will find interest. You know what I mean? Like, these are the names that will find interest. ATVI, the software names. Yeah, they, and you see like the stimulus bill, how the Democrats aren't participating. I got deja vu for those of you maybe around, maybe remember it. Remember when they voted down, voted against TARP, and then the market took a beating, and then they were forced to. So, you know, you were probably going to get the same shenanigans because, you know, Washington never learns. The Fed learned their lesson, but Washington never learns. They're going to force their hand, and that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're waiting for. But the market will tell us when it's enough. You can see everything the Fed has done, they've taken big steps already. 
but primarily for the bond market. You know what I mean? Bond market's got a lot of headaches. So that's been primarily for the bond market. Um, but there's this, they got to do so much more. The government's got to step in and do so much more. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things that got to fall into place. But once the market gets a taste and thinks they're on the right track of them taking action, that's when we might see some constructive price action. You know, as hard as it, as it may be. Disney, they got headaches. You know what I mean? These are the names. Um, who, who mentioned Disney? Pablo? Pablo, these are, yeah, Pablo, these are the names that like shorts have a field day with. You know what I mean? They have a field day with. I don't, I don't think all the park, are all the parks closed in Disney? Anybody have an answer to that? I know they closed some, right? The cruise, they closed all the parks. They're officially closed. Wow. Yeah, because uh, I know like Dan Niles mentioned he'd be interested in buying it once they do that. Um, but like when there's weakness, these are the names, you know, they're going to go after. Because yeah, these things, they're right in the heart of it. They're right in the heart of it. You know, right in the heart of it. Who's drawing on my screen? Wise guys. You guys think you're slick? I know you're out there. Um... Starbucks. <laughs> Who's that now? Starbucks. Let's take a look at Starbucks. God, I, I really, guys, I don't have a, an opinion on any of these things yet. I know most of you are probably talking uh, longer term stuff, right? Putting away. Um, at some point, you know, they, they look appetizing, but yeah, the thing is, is even if like we get it, if we get that intermediate term bottom, you know what I mean. Even if we do get that intermediate term bottom, there could be another leg south. You know, you you never know. You never know. So like putting names away longer term, yeah, you know what it is, guys. I need to see the flow. Otherwise, I'm clueless. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm clueless. You know. I'm clueless. I'm being honest with you guys. I'm clueless. Yeah, so in other words, sweepers meeting, you know, they come in, they get aggressive, they build position. You're going to see some of the, the big money at play out there start to build sizable positions and get aggressive. You know what I mean? And right now, there may be a few of them, right? And the problem with a few of them, you know, they could be wrong. They're human, right? They could be wrong. So we don't, we're not looking to bet on an Ackman or somebody being right. We want you know, kind of like those 2009 lows when Tepper and that whole crew came in aggressively and started buying the shit out of everything. That's kind of what we're looking for before we stick out our necks, you know? But, as, you know, this this whole virus thing, guys, I don't... Nobody knows how this plays out. Nobody knows. It's impossible to know. This is scary shit, you know? They're still, what are you guys talking about ES? It's not open. ES is open? No. Yeah, no, somebody was talking about ES. Um, no, I think to the morning. I think they're done now. Yeah, and, and JP, that's the thing. Like, selectively, okay, we're going to see names. Again, I use, like, I use McDonald's because there's nothing else really to use. But we're going to see names like McDonald's catch that upper echelon type action, okay? Because they're going to start picking at names. We're going to start to see that. Even if this market has lower to go, you know, you're going to see a name like Salesforce that's not going under. You know what I mean? Start to see aggressive accumulation. But it may be at lower prices. You know, it may be at lower prices. Uh, good question. So those of you who are new, that's, we follow option flow on a day-to-day on -day basis, all right? And that's what we're looking for, you know? 
we're basically looking at the order flow uh, throughout the day. Okay, like this. And that's where, um, you know, we see buying and call buying and put buying uh, come in, you know. Uh, by the way, 50 Cent, 50 Cent, whatever the hell his name is, he didn't, um, he didn't do anything else. You know what I mean? He don't have any VIX exposure on anymore. He's retired. <laughs> You're right. He retired now, you know? But, you know, maybe we see the VIX come in, you know, start to come in. So here's like the McDonald's action uh, for those of you who may not know what I'm talking about. All right. This was like three orders of what we saw come in. And, you know, just look at the size uh, behind it. You know, this one, six million, another million, another million. You know, if you take, if you sum all this up, if you add all of the dollar amount here, we, we didn't see all that flow in a span of two weeks from the whole entire market. You know, so again, this is just one name. So it doesn't really tell us much about the market as a whole, but when we start seeing multiple names catch action like this, uh, that's going to be a really good sign. You know, that's going to be a really, really good sign. Again, for that intermediate term bottom. Uh, anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions on uh, any sentiment stuff or on the market or on anything? Uh, SPY 270. Yeah, he here's the thing. Good question, because those of you who are members, I want to talk to you about that too. Um, in regards to ETF action, okay, you got to understand the market we're in right now, okay? There's a ton of ETF action out there, hedging, people are selling stocks, just put money in SPY, you know what I mean? So there's a gazillion different reasons, okay? I'm going to go back to what I tell you is the best type of flow overall as a signal. You want to see bands of buying, clusters of buying, where they come in one after the other, all right? And that's where you want to look for a trade, okay? But beyond the trade, guys, you know what I mean? Beyond the trade, you really want to see flow in individual names, you know? So in other words, if they're just buying spy calls, we, you know, it's worth a shot for a squeeze, but without the names involved, I wouldn't look for anything more than that. Okay, and we've been seeing that, right? That's kind of the only aggressive flow we've been seeing. They've been coming in and buying like spy calls that expire the next day, right? So it would be like tomorrow's expiration. They come in and they'd, you know, bum, they come one after the other in some cheap spy action. And then they catch sometimes a, a squeeze at the end of the day, you know? ES is open? Let's see. Are you guys spreading fake news here or what? Oh, you're right. It's open. No? Just put a one minute up here. Oh, yeah. It's open. Ah, excuse my French. Um, another thing, for those of you who are new out there, I don't pretend to be a teacher. You guys know me, but I'm not scolding anybody. But those of you who play options, you know, this is a tough market. So be careful. You know what I mean? You really, really want to feel good about um, things when you're, when you're taking positions because the implied vol out there, the premium out there, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. They're robbing people left and right. You know what I mean? They're robbing people left and right. So you fool around, play around, but wait for some confirmation before you, know, you, you put on a little bit of size. Otherwise, you know, you're asking for trouble. You're asking for trouble. It's tough. Ask anybody who's been playing this game long enough, okay? It's tough out there. No matter what, there are decent moves, but with IV jacked, it's tough out there. Ah! <laughs> Danger is my middle name. 
The last, the last person I heard say that dangers my middle lane was 100% margin, lost his house, car, account, and I was on the street corner with a cup. Yeah, so that, that's, that's more Scott. Honestly, those are more of the stories you hear like that. Like Scott saying, I made 50 grand on spy puts and then lost 80 on the next, you know? It's kind of those big swings, um, which, you know, if you're okay with it, it's fine, right? But if you're not okay with it, just size down. You know, just size down, have some fun. And then, like I said, that, that intermediate term bottom where volatility dies down, premium start, easing, that sort of thing, uh, that's where you'll find things a lot easier. I appreciate that, Stephen. I appreciate that. Um, anybody looking at any flow um, that they saw recently in names that they got their eyes? Gilead. Gilead. Gilead had some news tonight, right? Didn't Gilead had, had some news before I got on here? I saw something. The Widowmaker. Uh, so Gilead has been acting okay. You know, it, it's typical Gilead. We, we, we nicknamed Gilead the Widowmaker um, because, you know, for such a quality company, it's been such a disaster of a stock, you know, a disaster. But, you know, it's in play right now. And look at it. Like, this is Gilead in play. It's an ulcer. You know what I mean? Even this is not smooth. Like, Gilead is in play, and this thing still can't act right. You know, a lot of people, um, members that I've spoke to, uh, have played this one instead off flow, um, and it's been acting a little bit better. This MRNA, well, a lot better. MRNA. Uh, but you just want to, um, you know, you don't want to wear out your welcome unless you're okay with that option going out, you know, going to zero. Because uh, if they're not in the running for that drug at the end, you know, a lot of times these things get whacked. You know, get whacked. A couple of VIX people I know, I'm not a big follower of VIX, um, but a couple of VIX guys I know think that volatility is coming down, that they would bet against volatility from it. Uh, we've seen that in flow somewhat as well. Uh, we've seen call selling, right? We saw some call selling and put buying. Uh, so we're seeing some money bet against VIX. Uh, OT, yeah, 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 that's it. The call seller, OT just posted. You know, so, you know, VIX, let's see, do I have, uh, can I get it on here, VIX? I think so, right? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe, oh, by the way, the, what, the other thing, too, on as far as sentiment is concerned, the Sharpies, they're really, a, it's a good indicator, too, with VIX, the VIX futures. When they're maxed out, in other words, when they start net, a net short position on VIX, they usually come in around VIX highs. They're not there yet. So I'm talking about, so you guys know, the uh, COT data every week, right? They were net long VIX into this useless bottom. And then, you know, now this spike, um, they've trimmed their position, but haven't gone net short yet. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I would look. That's also another confirmation on the market, too. Um, so, you know, those are the signals I'm waiting for. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't need to nail the exact low. You know what I'm saying? I want, I want to play with a little bit of confidence. Right now, I have nothing to be confident over. You know, nothing. Nothing at all. I, you know, the bond market, I don't trust either. I don't know what the hell's going on there, you know? I don't know what's going on there. Uh, TLT, you would think with the Fed... Right, Anton, with the Fed doing what it's doing, I mean, TLT is still the play, right? I think. But you saw the shenanigans last week, was it last week, where 
rates started creeping higher and TLT got whacked. You know, it made no sense. So in liquidation mode, nothing, nothing makes sense. That's the whole point. You know what I mean? Nothing makes sense. That's the problem. So I would let things settle just like we're waiting for confirmation and then reevaluate. But right now, nothing makes sense. Yeah, spreads are nuts. They're nuts. That's why um, you know, the Fed's got to really step on the gas here. You know? Good qu- yeah, same thing, Jimmy. Gold and silver, I think you got to be patient here. I really do. I think you got to be patient. You know why? You have a lot of long money in gold and silver. And if they need to liquidate, they're going to sell gold and silver. That's the only thing they got money in. Everything else is walloped. So I would be careful. Again, if you like it, I would just sit tight and wait it out a little bit. That's all. You know, get through this liquidation phase. Yeah, right. Uh, Longer term, you would think with everything going on, gold should be heading higher, right? But right now... It wouldn't shock me if gold got whacked, GLD. It wouldn't shock me one bit. Uh, Somebody mentioned an interesting, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We saw a little bit of buying in this thing on Friday. Decent buying. ABBV could get size. I would definitely keep an eye on it tomorrow. You probably get weakness with the futures, you know? I would definitely keep an eye on it. Yeah, you know, here's another example right? ABBV, like a lot of these biotechs and pharma names, they should be acting better soon, but not to sound like a broken record. When you're in liquidation mode, they sell everything, not because they want to, because they have to. You know, so who did that? I'm going to track them down. Who's drawing on my screen? I'm going to send two zips. When I find out who it is, two zippers are coming your way and you're going to get whacked. Yeah, keep it up. Go ahead. I'll catch you in the act. I'll see a smile on somebody's face soon. (laughs) What else? Costco, Amazon, those are studs. Honestly, uh, that's where we probably see flow come in eventually when they come in. You know, those bigger names. That's the stud there. Anybody own it? This one? Anybody own the Teladoc? Anybody? Do you, Valerie? That's awesome. That's awesome. This is some stock. And you got Trump, you got the Trumpster uh, touting it every two seconds. Watch this. I will be the greatest president that God ever created. Look. I'm really rich. I will build a great, great wall on our southern border, and I will have Mexico pay for that wall. I don't wear it to pay. It's my hair. I swear. (laughs) Let's go Mets. It's a Met fan. Track him down. Track him down. That's it. They gave up. It's a Met fan. Figures. Come on, would I expect any different? Freaking meth fan drawing on my screen. A meth fan drawing on my screen. All right, guys, anybody else have anything to add? Um, let me throw a couple names um, that I've been, that are on my wa- watch list. Uh, this name, sort of a little bit of uh, nibbling in it, D-Dog. Anybody familiar with it? A lot of us played it. Uh, when did we play it? Back here, right? Over here somewhere, I think. D-Dog, uh, it's a software name. It's a software name. And a recent IPO and some unusual sweeper activity came into it. I think it was Thursday. Thursday. All right, let me see. I think I have it on here. Uh, but, you know, nice tech name that doesn't have much exposure to this. Here it is. July's. July 42 call. All right, so that's one name I got. Yeah, it's a good-looking stock. You know, it's a good-looking stock. So I, 
what I would want, the ideal scenario, Maria, you remember the last correction we were in. I keep using it as an example because it was the perfect example. SE. Okay. And they came in bombarding this thing down here. All right. And this was the December 2018. Around the holidays, nobody could give a rat's behind about buying an SE. We didn't even know what the, co who, you know, we never heard of the name. Okay. We never heard of the name in our lives. All right. But right here, they bought, a, it was a bull risk reversal. Then they came in again, sold puts to buy call spreads. Then they swept some calls. Then they hit it again. All right. And I remember a saying, I remember a saying like, what is this SE that they keep coming back for? Like, you know, a lot of us didn't even buy it when the action came in at first. But then you couldn't, you couldn't, couldn't help but notice it. All right. And they built a position down here. Okay. They were early when they started. And, they, you know, all of a sudden now everybody knows the name. Okay. So the beauty of this, this type of market is you're going to get new leaders, right? You get new hot growth names that come out of it. You see, like, Teladoc, what's going on? You're going to have a, a chunk of names that when eventually this comes to an end. The problem is, when does this come to an end? That's the problem. You know, it's a timing thing that we don't know until we know. You understand? You know, so that's what keeps me involved right now, right? Because I'm not shorting. Right. I can't go short in this thing, right? Um, puts, I can't get myself to play puts because they're so inflated. I'm talking about even in the climate we're in, right? You really got to catch a big move. So what keeps me involved and in what I do every day, I come in looking for patterns of buying, you know, to find potentially the next SE. Or, you know, they'll come in and tattoo a Microsoft, and I think I could get some momentum out of it even over the short term, and I'll buy, you know, make a play on Microsoft. But, you know, that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm doing right now, all right? But the goal is to hang around and have my eyes open to when those buyers come in that we went over. When they're there, I notice them, you know? Well, when shit hits the fan in New York over the next couple of weeks, like I'm telling you, right? And you're going to see hysteria. You're going to see craziness out of New York. The hospital's overflowing. They're going to move them into the Javits Center. They're getting ready. The talk is already here, okay? I have to remember to keep my eyes open on the signals because if they start buying into that hysteria and panic, I need to, I need to be ready, you know? I need to be ready. The news is only going to get worse. Like, you see the, the numbers, honestly? Do you see the numbers of... Uh, like New York right now, the totals of sick are inflating, right? Because they've tested. They're starting to test. They're not testing anywhere else. You see, like, California? What do they got? A thousand? Come on. Yeah, 15,000 in New York now because they started testing. Wait, watch Florida. Wait till you see what happens in Florida if they start testing. Florida, they're, they're like a whole different country over there. They don't even know the, about coronavirus. Yep, crazy, right? Now he ain't 24,000 in New York. You know what it is? Everyone's on top of each other there. It's, I mean, it's a time bomb. It's a time bomb. But Florida, you got a lot of like, you got an older population there, retirees and all. It could get scary there. Exactly. That's what I'm saying, Alan. Exactly. Right, they're drinking Corona. They, th they know that's what it means. Crack over a bottle of Corona, go hang out on the beach. They lost their minds. And that's the thing for, listen, right? The fear, like for us talking here, you worry about elderly relatives who are maybe older. You know what I mean? That's the main concern. But the concern we're paying attention to is not the, fatal, the fatal part of this, right? It's economically, the damage that it's going to do economically. I just, I can't even believe baseball is gone. You know what I mean? Like sports are gone. I don't even know. To, I don't know what to do with myself. 
when when is baseball coming back? It's not coming back, is it? When's baseball coming back? They're gone, right, Sam? <laughs> I feel like crying. I really do. I feel like crying. I feel like crying. Seriously, Mark Sanders. <laughs> this is all the Astros' fault. I think they were involved in this virus to cover up their mess, if you ask me. If you ask me. It's all the Astros' fault. No, but you know what I mean? Like, when I was uh, listening to Gottlieb today, he's good if you want, you know, to learn about this shit and you're curious for the facts. Dr. Gottlieb, you see him on CNBC a lot. He said, what's got to happen and they got to start planning now. What's the, what's the exit strategy? Okay, when this tapers off in June, which it's likely going to do, okay? The end of May, June, you start to see things calm down. What's the, you know, what's the program in getting people back into things like China's sort of doing? There's not going to be a switch that you flip on and everybody goes back to work. Everybody goes to a ball game. Every, you could go to concerts. You could, that's not going to happen. You know, so it's going to be like gradual phases and steps where things start to turn back on. That's a disaster economically, a disaster. So I don't know what it ultimately means besides a lot of companies go out of business and reshapes the whole economy. That's the, that's the only thing I see out of this unless some miracle this thing evaporates over the next month. You know? Right. And you can't trust. That's the thing. You can't trust anything you're hearing out of them. You're right. The elections, you know, people worry this thing's going to come back in the fall. See, the, the thing is, though, honestly, I'm a little more optimistic in the fall. You know why? I think medically, medicine, as far as medicines are concerned and stuff like that, I think we're going to have more ammo to fire back at the virus come the fall. Right? And then as you go into next year, you're talking about a vaccine and stuff. But, you know, from now till then, right, this period, which is a couple months, I just, I don't know how some of these businesses survive. Right, the, they say the weather helps with the, the virus and all, but you're still talking about, you're not, things aren't going back to normal, right, Alan? You think things are going to go right back to normal because of that? You know, so now you go from what? Depression type numbers to 2008 Great Recession type numbers? That's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, I know that's, I don't know, it's, I don't know, guys. You know, I have no idea. We all, we all have our thoughts feeling nobody knows. That's the truth of it. Nobody knows. Okay, you hear a lot of people talk about it. Nobody knows how this thing plays out. Nobody. The smartest minds don't know. What keeps me awake is that there's no baseball season. You know what keeps me awake? If they take away baseball and then they shut down the market, you might, you might see me floating in my bay right here. If they take away baseball and they take away the market, you might not hear from me again. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie to you. We halted again? God bless America. <laughs> exactly. All right, guys. Go relax. Oh, we're not halted? <laughs> hey, you guys, are, we got a bunch of comedians here. Wise asses and comedians. Why is it showing, uh, why am I showing halted? Who knows these quotes, these quotes. Oh, okay, I got it, thank you. I thought it was. All right, guys, sorry for the old mix up on GoToWebinar and all. Uh, pot stocks, I would, forget pot stocks. Uh, sorry about the mix up and all um, with GoToWebinar. Zoom, I like it already. Uh, so that would probably be the route we go. Get some rest. All right, good luck this week. I'll see the most of you tomorrow. Have a good night, everybody.